Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify the mental health system. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Dwayne Battle, who is an associate professor of teaching, director of the baccalaureate program, and course coordinator of the diversity and oppression courses for the Rutgers School of Social Work graduate and undergraduate programs. Dr. Battle is an expert on the topics of diversity and social justice, spirituality and social work, as well as the welfare of children. Dr. Battle, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you very much, Dr. Nash. It's my privilege and delight to be with you. I'm so grateful for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to our time together and our conversation. So thank you. I'm really happy you can make time for this interview on such short notice, as I believe many people would benefit from your insights right now. Thank you very much. These are indeed interesting times, times of change and challenges, times of of opportunities. I often think of obstacles as being opportunities and burdens as being blessings. And so in the times in which we find ourselves, from a strengths perspective, I'm looking for opportunities to move forward. I am too. So Dr. Battle, can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development? that led to your interest in diversity and social justice, as well as your interest in religion and spirituality? Certainly. So just a little bit about me. I grew up in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. My family was originally both parents from North Carolina. And that's really important because my family, my parents represent a point in history in our nation where there was a migration of black people from the southern states in our nation. And they migrated within the nation to the north and the Midwest, to the west, different parts of the nation. So my family, my parents migrated from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. I grew up in the northeast section of D.C. And it was an integrated community. To the left of our family was an Irish-American family. And to the right of our family was an African-American family. Latino families were in the neighborhood. So it was a, a mixed neighborhood. I grew up in the church. My church experience was in a Protestant tradition, the Baptist church. And so I attended a Black Baptist church, which was great for my sense of spiritual formation, culture, identity. I then continue with part of my family's history which was not if you were going to go to college, nor even where you were going to go to college. It was like understood you were going to go to college and that the college of choice for our family was Howard University there in Washington, D.C. So I started college there. My own personal goal was to be a dentist. And as it turned out, I spent more time in the divinity school than in my pre-dental classes, or at least that's where my interest was. And after three years at Howard University, I uh, left Washington, D.C., relocated, wait for it, drum roll, relocated (laughs) to North Carolina. And so kind of going in the opposite direction of where my parents came from. And I completed my education there, both undergraduate religion and philosophy major with a history minor. From there, I went into seminary at Wake Forest and completed both my master's of divinity and my doctor of ministry degrees and began pastoral work there in North Carolina, served several wonderful congregations. I also had the chance to work for five years with the chaplain's department of our local hospital in pastoral care. And really, Dr. Nash, close to our conversation today, I spent a year at the John B. Umstead Hospital, which was in Butner, North Carolina, and it was one of the state mental health facilities. So I gained a lot in terms of clinical pastoral education in that area. Fast forward, after being in North Carolina for 12 years and doing all the things that I just mentioned, I came to New Jersey. I was asked to come to New Jersey to serve a congregation and was serving a church, a wonderful church in North Jersey. And in that church, I ended up with 34 affinity ministries, groups, outreach programs that found me providing social services, delivering social work, as it were, to people in the church and the community. And for that reason, I 
spent time at Rutgers, both as a student. In fact, the last 27 years, I've been at Rutgers as a MSW student, PhD student in social work since then on the faculty. So that's a long, interesting story, but it connects the pieces of my upbringing and background, most between North Carolina and Washington, D.C., and my training in both ministry and social work, where I've been practicing. So there it is. Thank you. I think there is a connection between pastoral work and social work. I think I see that in my life too. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. When I attended the Rutgers MSW program and had the privilege of being one of your students in the diversity and oppression course, I remember thinking, I think everyone would benefit from taking this course. So can you give us a brief overview of the core principles of that class? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the diversity and oppression course is one of the required courses in both the MSW program and also undergraduate social work curriculum. And the course is intended to help students have a sense of the importance of the social justice core principles in our field of study. The course is designed to be an experiential course, more than just obtaining new information. It's about knowledge, values, and skills. And the course, as I conceive it, involves the student making a, an environmental scan, looking around to see the messages that are everywhere to be found. One of the assignments early on in the course is an assignment called White is Right. So the messaging that comes back to us is that white is normative and everything else is non-normative. The students are then encouraged to do a review of history and looking at some of the issues around slavery and Jim Crow laws, things of that sort. And moving from there, students are encouraged to do an assessment of their own family's personal background and where they fit on the continuum of privilege and oppression. It's really insightful. Students often suggest that they've not given a lot of thought to their ethnic background, that they just think of themselves as being American and perhaps white, but not looking beyond that. So the students interview an older family member and gain new insights and understanding about their background. From that assignment, students then move further into the semester and interview someone who is of a different race, as well as another point of intersectionality. It could be sexual orientation, levels of ability, different areas of ableness. It could be different religions, ethnic backgrounds, etc. So students interview someone from a different group. They also do a literature review, compare the students, the interviewee's experience with the research, and then they talk about what the differences are between the interview and the literature review and the implications for social work. And then towards the end of the semester, students are encouraged to look at structural oppression, institutional racism, and call to action from the field of social work to address anti-Black racism and to uh, improve our profession as well as the lives of persons that we work with, clients, their systems, families, agencies, etc., and broader to improve society. So that's the course, 15 weeks in about three or four minutes. And it is experiential. And I think the whole point of it is bringing people closer together and experiencing another point of view. And and it really helps with empathy and getting some information from our elders and some other points of view. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting you would say that because in my fantasy world, if I were able to teach this course any way I wanted to, I would probably have students to pair up with someone who is different in the categories that were mentioned earlier, someone who's of a different race, and then a diff- another, at least one other difference, and have them spend the entire semester, if not the entire year, but it's the entire semester with each other and get to know each other, as you suggested, better. And from the interview literature review assignment, students are encouraged to attend a social event with their interviewee where the interviewee is in the majority and the student is out of her comfort zone, so to speak. And the learning that can come from that creates a sense of cultural humility and helps the student to realize that we are not the experts in another person's experience and that we 
if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, we can get to know that person and from their own cultural experience better. So Dr. Battle, you mentioned people are taught to think of white as normative. Can you talk a bit more about this? Certainly. I know I mentioned earlier about an exercise that we have in the diversity and oppression course early in the semester called White is Right. And the question you just raised really is what that assignment is about. It's about helping students to take stock of the messages that are communicated to them just in the normal course of the day that communicate that white is normative or that white is right. And so what students are uh, asked to do is to you know, just simply scan the environment and just be aware of all the indications that communicate the idea that white is right or that being white is normative and in some cases even superior. And so I give them the, the example that if you go in and you're looking for bandages, because bandages are very colorful and they come in all kinds of cool designs, especially for kids. But the bandages that identify as being flesh colored, the question comes back, well, whose flesh do they best represent? The answer is obvious. They are more akin to white skin. That's the example that I give students when they are given the assignment. Now, what they come back with is remarkable, you know, many of the times, things that I myself have not given thought of. And so it's an exciting assignment. And so they come back with different things that they notice. I know sometimes they will take notice of the television personalities that dominate the media. And of course, some of this has changed uh, over the years, but it was not uncommon for the television anchors to largely be white and not represent the cultures and the community. So you could be in an area of the country that is more widely known to represent black and brown people, and yet the persons that are reporting the news to them are white. The same would be true going into stores of your local CVS or Walgreens, and the products that would be there for beauty products would more often than not relate to white people. And so in some of these stores, they have identified an ethnic section, and that section is typically really, really small. So the message, of course, that's communicated is white is right. If you think about food, if we we ask, we go to a restaurant that serves American food, it's less likely to have food that might be represented by other cultural groups that are still, you know, a part of the American society. The examples that students give to me include things like the blonde-haired, blue-eyed representation of Jesus. Santa Claus, of course, is depicted as being white. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on. But that's that. those are examples of how white is considered as normative. The one thing I would add to that is, given the, the current pandemic that we're faced with, and we're looking at health disparities, When people talk about the rate of disease or or whatnot, they're typically talking about those numbers that most represent the white community. If you compare, for instance, unemployment or the wage gap between men and women, they're not talking about typically the wage gap between black women and white men. They're talking typically about the gap between white women. There's a greater gap in the wage earnings of black women and a greater gap of unemployment among black men, as an example. So that's how I think that people are taught rather implicitly to think of white as normative. So even in the field of social work, would you say there's an issue with this as well? Yeah, I'm glad you raised it. The reality is that our field of social work, which is a great and noble field that you and I are involved in, but it was also born out of white supremacist, racist society. And so we're taught to think of the pioneers in social work as being these white pioneers, people who did great work, Jane Addams, Mary Richmond, but they're white. And there are others who were very much involved in providing social services and social relief to our communities but we don't hear about them as much. And as a result, we end up with an overrepresentation of white 
women in particular in the field of social work, and people think of social workers as being white. So when white women would go into communities of color and provide social services, they were thought of as being outside of the community, that they did not represent the community, and they were seeking to serve black and brown populations when they didn't have black and brown social workers representing them. So we've got a lot of work to do, not just in social work practice, but in fields of social work education and our different schools and programs, and over-representation of white social work educators and practitioners. And we need to have more African-American and Latin representatives. I think Rutgers is working on addressing these disparities. Am I correct? Well, Rutgers is certainly making progress. We are in the most diverse state in the nation, and we represent the largest supplier of social workers to state government and to social work agencies in the state. But there's tremendous room for improvement, and our students are calling for that, that they want to see more representation of Black faculty in the classrooms, Black administrators in leadership roles in the School of Social Work. And the same would be true in other departments at our university as well. We've recently seen people pay more attention to language. Like Silicon Valley is now committed to replacing their use of programming terms like whitelist, blacklist, master, and slave. While it is hard to believe these terms were ever chosen, what role does language play in the development and reinforcement of these normative beliefs? Again, that's a great question, and it connects actually with what we were just speaking about, because language is used to communicate and promote what's normative in society and what is considered to be dominant or majority. So we use language like majority, minority. We identify different people as being good or bad, and oftentimes language is wrapped up in that. An example would be, so when I grew up, my father, he often would look at the Westerns, as they were called. I enjoyed spending time with him looking at Westerns. And so fast forward many years later, my father's passed away, and I find myself sometimes looking at Westerns, and I see both the use of the language, but also just the apparent racism that was communicated and perpetuated. So good guys wore white hats. The good guys dressed in white. The good guys rode on white horses. (laughs) And conversely, (laughs) the bad guys, you can figure this one out, they wore (laughs) black hats. They dressed in black and they rode on black horses. So language is used in that way. We often, when we think of things that are pure or moral or spotless or innocent, we are thinking about things that are related to white or what is light. Native Americans and African Americans have been described as being uncivilized or pagan, savage. They were referred to Native Americans in some of those movies as being savages. And Africans in the Tarzan genre were referred to as being savages and, and even cannibalistic. So the use of language, again, communicates and perpetuates that white is normative and dominant. And you've given some good examples in terms of whitelist and blacklist. Think about what's the difference. If it's a white lie, (laughs) that's a lie that's a little bit less impactful. Or think about when someone is blackmailed or blackballed. It communicates something that is undesirable on the scale of desirability. Uh, So language certainly further communicates racist ideas. And that's why it has to be addressed. And I'm glad that they're addressing it in Silicon Valley. Also, I I would just use, it's, it's related to language, but if you think about emojis, emojis, when we really first started taking notice of them, the emojis represented white people. In more recent times, you can get, if it's a a thumbs up or a symbol for praying hands, you at least get variations of shades of difference so the person who's using it can choose what's preferred. But initially, it certainly represented white people and, again, white being normative and language being used to reinforce that. The same is true throughout every level of society, the way that language is 
use further perpetuates racism. Talked about how do you think that might impact a black child or a white child in terms of it being such casual speech and even leading to something like internalized stigma? And maybe that's a term maybe people don't know, but you can explain. When we think about racism, racism can be internalized, which is how an individual can take on what the messages that are communicated in society and believe those things to be true about oneself. It can impact interpersonal relationships. We've spoken a bit about institutional racism, so it's in the various institutions in society. So when messages are communicated by racist language, it will impact the way that children of all races perceive the world. Their worldview is being shaped by the messages that are being communicated to them. So white children are taught through the use of language to see the world in a monocultural, monolingual way. And it's difficult for them to understand perhaps later in life that that worldview is a very limited worldview. Conversely, black and brown children, if they didn't have the availability of family and neighbors, friends who could help correct some of those messages, those children would be impacted by absorbing like a sponge, absorbing those messages that are being communicated to the detriment of one's own sense of self-awareness and self-identity. So language is very impactful in the messages that are communicated to children. And when we use language that promotes racism, it impacts white children, black children, brown children. It impacts all children. So how would you define the terms bias, prejudice, and discrimination, and how they culminate in a structural system of racism? Yeah, so those are, those are <laughs> re- really important terms. They're all related together. Bias, in its simplest language, is a preference uh, for a different person or idea, group. It's just, it's about, it's about preference, and we are taught to have certain uh, preferences, and typically... We have a bias towards people or groups that we favor and that we have negative bias against other groups that we disfavor. So that's how I think of bias. Prejudice and discrimination go, all three terms go together. But the way I describe prejudice is to use the term prejudge, which is what prejudice really means. It's to prejudge someone oftentimes without getting to to know that person, and it has to do with attitudes and beliefs. So to have prejudice against someone relates to how we think about those persons, our attitudes towards those individuals, our beliefs about the groups that they represent. And we do that more often than not without getting to know the individual or the group. So we prejudge. Related to that is discrimination. Discrimination comes out of prejudice And it has to do with actions and behavior. So when we prejudge someone, especially from a a negative perspective, when we have these beliefs or attitudes towards people who are different, that will then lead to examples of actions and behaviors that are what we define as discrimination. Can you talk about stigma and how it can lead to structural racism? Absolutely. As we were just talking about bias, prejudice, and discrimination, stigma involves negative attitudes. So it's the bias and also the prejudice and discrimination because stigma is typically negative. It's against someone. And stigma is really about separating people and causing people to be isolated from other groups. So the way that that plays out in our systems that we have is that we end up with structural oppression. We often think of structural racism as an example. We think of institutional racism. So the structural aspects has to do with the various policies and practices that are ingrained in our society, and they promote inequity in our cultural issues that we're facing within our nation that focus on anti-Black racism that's based on structural racism. 
And that term is often linked to systemic racism or systemic oppression, which again has to do with the structure. So those terms are often thought of as things synonymous, structural and systemic or institutional. The point being that it's in the institutions, it's in our society, and that even if people are not aware of it in terms of their own behaviors and actions, it actually takes place within the fabric of society and our institutions as well. And sometimes you don't even notice it. Yeah, and and that really is the, you're absolutely right. Again, that's really the insidious nature of systemic oppression and racism. One of the things we often reflect on in the course, the diversity and oppression course, is where we talk about Peggy McIntosh's The Invisible Knapsack. And The Invisible Knapsack is where white people are taught to, through the systems and the structures in society, to ignore the benefits that white privilege afford white people. And that's because it's in the systems, it's in the structures and the institutions. And so oftentimes at the individual level, you're not aware of it. You think of it as something that happened maybe in the past in terms of a historical analysis. But what happened in the past is a part of the institutions and the fabric of society today. So you don't have to think about it. It happens. And that's the the unfortunate thing. The thing that we have to do to correct that is that we have to think about it. We have to acknowledge it, face it, and have, as we are having right now, conversations about it, and that the conversations can lead to policies and practices at an individual as well as societal, structural, institutional levels. Now, can you give us an example of, like, let's say a policy or something that we talk about these terms structural and systemic, but can you give an example of an actual example of this? The examples are often revealed in what we refer to as challenging racial disparities. So racial disparities appear throughout various levels of society. If you think about education as an example, education is linked in our our country to where a person lives. And so the way that we have segregated communities and we have communities that are lower socioeconomic status, it will impact the resources, the financial resources that go into educational systems. So there is the opportunity for disparities in education to take place. It continues with employment, with wages. If you look at the wages that black people receive compared to whites for the same jobs, same qualifications, blacks will get paid less. In fact, blacks will get paid less even with higher education than whites. This could go on in terms of education, employment, health care. It's throughout every aspect. So policies that are put into place are put into place to try to correct some of the structural aspects of systemic and institutional racism. And I also think that that could bring us together when we think about rather than looking at the individual, look at the policy. And I think we can agree that some policies could be changed for the good of everybody. Yes. Yeah, we're taught to think of, going back to the earlier conversation about prejudice, bias, stigma, discrimination, we're taught to think about those things at an individual level. And at the individual level, you want to, if there's something wrong, you want to correct the individual. You want to fix the individual. But if we see it at a larger level, then you want to bring about policies and practices at the structural institutional levels. And at that level, it serves to benefit not only the individual, but the larger society. What is the difference between ethnicity, race, and culture? (laughs) I feel like we're back in class right now. We are. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So these terms, again, are related to each other. But ethnicity has to do with a person's national origin. So I think of ethnicity in terms of where a person comes from. Culture has to do with the things that are passed on from one generation to another. And those are the things that we learn often, again, from our elders, which is why the personal background assignment is to get students to talk to older family members, because they're the ones who pass down our culture from generation to generation. Now, race is a much larger issue. It's it's really the 
problem conversation because there's no such thing really as race. Race is a socio-political construct that began in the first half of the 19th century and somewhat embarrassed to say that the person who was one of the earlier champions of this was someone from Philadelphia who did work that has been used since his initial work to create these systems that have led to racism. But it was work that was done by Samuel Morton out of Philadelphia, who looked at skulls. He looked at skulls and created these pseudoscience distinctions of people based on skulls. Of course, he he started out at the top of the hierarchy, were whites or Caucasians, and from there, East Asians. From there were Southeast Asians, and then Native Americans with blacks being at the lowest point of the hierarchy. So that's where that began. Now, after his work, Morton's work, we end up with uh, Darwin's theories about evolution and the survival of the fittest. And it kind of leads some to believe that certain races are more intelligent while others are inferior. And all this was done in the period that was pre-Civil War, where there was an attempt to undergird the involuntary servitude and slavery of Black Africans in the American and Caribbean experience to undergird that and support that with this this false sign. So that's what's continued to perpetuate power and privilege for whites and to diminish the opportunities and power and privilege for blacks. And it really speaks to the importance of going deep and understanding ideology because ideas can really like this, even in science, I just think they can cause some problems if we don't really look at them carefully. I would agree with you. In fact, again, going back to Peggy McIntosh's The Invisible Knapsack, we're taught through history, the education being an example, reinforces, reproduces white privilege, colonialism, structural racism. So if we don't go back and look at these issues the way that you and I have done in our social work curriculum and the way that we're doing even on this podcast. If we don't go back and do a reread of history, looking at it through a new lens, a lens that is aware of oppression and privilege, then we're going to perpetuate the same mistakes, and not even mistakes, the same white privilege and oppression that's been a part of our nation's history. And I think that it's important that we continue to learn about these issues for our whole lives. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. In fact, you're talking to a professional student. I, I sometimes tease and say that I used to have to pay to go to school, and now they pay me to come to school. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and although I'm in a role as an educator or professor, the truth is that in the field of social work, we teach the importance of being lifelong learners. And in my own personal quest, I don't want to be anywhere where I can't, A, learn something, and B, find some enjoyment or reason for for being there. And so as individuals, we have to take a responsibility for our own learning. In the diversity and oppression course, I say to students, typically on day one, that you are not to be judged or blamed for the worldview that brings you into this class, whatever you've been taught, whatever you've learned, whatever your thoughts and beliefs are, you're not going to be judged about that. However, moving forward, you are going to be held accountable for the new growth and learning and knowledge that you gain from the course and that you have to allow that to impact your value system, your worldview and your skills. So. I agree with you that we have to take it upon ourselves to learn, to grow, to seek new information, and then to allow that to give us a new orientation in our lives. How does racism hurt the person who's behaving in a racist way and the person who's the target of their racist views? One of the ways I would respond to that is something that I was exposed to when I was a student, 
a young student, a young undergraduate student at Howard University, but even more recently, the work of James Baldwin. James Baldwin, who is a phenomenal thinker and writer, was a part of the Harlem Renaissance, an important period in our nation's history. But Baldwin had a work that is entitled, I Am Not Your Negro. And there have been interviews that have been out recently during this period of time in which we find ourselves with the COVID-19 pandemic, with the racial unrest related to police brutality and Black Lives Matter protests, and also the economic recession that we've been in with unemployment and so forth. We've had access to resources through Netflix, Prime Video, and other sources. And then James Baldwin's work, I Am Not Your Negro, he challenges white people, and in particular racists, to determine why they felt the need to create this notion of race and racism and this understanding of blacks as being inferior. And so he, he, he makes the case that I am not your Negro. There was something missing within you that caused you to feel the need to create this category. So you need to examine for yourselves what that is. So more directly to your question, by perpetuating racism, the racist is chained and imprisoned by racist views and practices. We will never achieve at a national level the greatness that we aspire to as long as we try to hold back people who are not white, blacks, browns, people who are considered to be less than. Having strong family ties is often an important factor in achieving success. Because the familial ties of many African Americans were broken due to slavery, could looking through a family theory lens help us understand their experience better? That's a wonderful question from a clinical perspective in terms of how we work with individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. The thing that's important there is for social workers to approach working with African-American families or other families through a lens of cultural humility. We used to talk a lot about cultural competence in social work, and even before cultural competence was cultural awareness, and before that was diversity, celebrating diversity. So we progressed through some of this. So we're not just celebrating diversity, we're challenging disparities. We're not just looking at different, trying to become competent because we know more about different groups. Looking at families, African-American families and other families through a lens of cultural humility. And what that means is that the social worker, again, is not the expert. The expert is the client system, that family, so we can learn from the family. Social workers who are not African-American can learn about the family dynamics of African-Americans through a lens of cultural humility. For hundreds of years, the structures, the systems, the institutions were designed to separate Black families, African-American families from each other. And so using a lens that's related to family theory has to be one that approaches this through cultural humility. And a family could be a multi-generational family. And again, there's a diversity within the African-American experience as well. You're absolutely right. Blacks who were brought here as slaves and who are understood to be, you know, there's been an evolution as how Blacks have been identified. Some of the terms are too derogatory to mention in this podcast, but I mentioned James Baldwin's work, I Am Not Your Negro. Blacks were referred to as Negroes at one point. And through the civil rights era and the Black Power Movement, and now through Black Lives Matter, Blacks have embraced, African Americans have embraced what was intended to be derogatory race. And Blacks have embraced that. But within the Black race, there are differences. Africans who were taken from their homeland in Africa and brought along the Middle Passage to slavery, some were brought to 
what has become the United States. Some were taken to the various Caribbean islands, others to Europe. So you have blacks that are dispersed throughout the world, and we can end up with blacks who migrate from Europe or the Caribbean, and they come to the United States and from Africa. In more recent times, their experience is unique and different because of what I mentioned earlier, that ethnicity is your nationality. So you can have people who are identified as Asian, but they can be Korean, Chinese, Filipino, all Asian, but different ethnicities. And you can have people that are Black, but they come from different places, so they can have a different ethnic background. And I know in my family, it is those social connections as we immigrated from Ireland that had advantages to, to the community and, the, and, the, and even within the church. And, and you came over to this country and you were sort of able to be lifted up. And sometimes when you have those traumas, I mean, I, we, we, we talk about the Middle Passage and we talk about a unique trauma history. I think that it, it just is a nuanced thing to talk about when it comes to, it kind of speaks to some of the privilege that we were talking about before. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm really glad you mentioned your own ethnic background because <laughs> I did one of the DNA tests recently uh, in the last couple of years, traveled to Ireland and beautiful, beautiful country, rich history. People were surprised to discover that more than 20% of my own DNA is Irish, <laughs> which, is, which is which is really, you know, laughable. But here's the thing. I know more about that aspect of my European ancestry than some of my own African ancestry because of the trauma of separating Africans from their African culture and history. That's a painful reality. But you're right. There are differences within groups. And that's why it's important to talk not just about this made-up construct of race, but to talk about ethnicity and culture, because we get to know more about people at that level. So Dr. Battle, is there anything I didn't ask you that you think is important for people to know about? I do want to thank you again for this tremendous opportunity to join you for this podcast. I think we've had a, a great discussion. The only thing that I think that you have not asked me that you should ask me whether I'm, I'm willing to come back and have another conversation with you in the future. <laughs> and the answer of to that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely, yes. I agree. It was, it's been great. So Dr. Battle, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to social work and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand diversity and social justice as well as spirituality and social work. Well, Dr. Nash, has been my pleasure. Thank you again for inviting me. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast. So you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There's no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. <laughs>